All right, hello, hello for potentially the most important lesson in all of VC economics, where we'll be talking about the five sector circular flow model, which basically gives you the basis for answering all aggregate demand questions throughout the whole year, giving you the perfect structure to explain how any aggregate demand side factor is going to impact on aggregate demand and the three domestic macroeconomic goals. So this is incredibly important to really understand and be all over because having these skills is going to benefit you not only in this topic, but in unit four and in your exam, and it will help you do incredibly well throughout the whole year. So our key knowledge today is quite large. We're looking at the five sector circular flow model of income, including the role of households, businesses, government, financial institutions, and the external sector in an open contemporary macro economy. Then we're gonna look at the meaning and importance of aggregate demand and the factors that may affect aggregate demand, as well as the same for aggregate supply. So our main intention, as it has been for this whole topic, is to understand the impact of changing economic activity on the domestic macroeconomic goals. And our success criteria is that you can describe the flows between the household and business sectors. There's four of them. They're going to be really, really important. And you can distinguish between leakages and injections to aggregate demand. And you can apply how factors that would impact the five sector circular flow model, um, how that impact aggregate demand as well as aggregate supply. So when we look at the circular flow model, it illustrates how the Australian economy works and how its parts are interrelated. Additionally, it identifies some of the macroeconomic variables affecting our country's economic conditions. So it will show us how when some of these factors change, how they will impact on the economy and how they'll flow on to affect other parts of it. So we're gonna start with a blank slide on the next slide and we're gonna draw it out step by step because it's gonna help it make a lot more sense than if we just looked straight at the model. So hopefully you remember from unit one and two VC economics, that we had a two sector model where we had households over one side. So we had the household sector on one side and we had the business sector on the other side. Or if you're watching this in 2024, you would have a three sector model where there was also government. We're gonna look at this based on what you knew about the two sector models. So households provide businesses with resources. So we've got flow one, flow of resources, and what that meant was that was like labor, land, capital that businesses were getting from households so they could produce goods and services. Then in return for that, businesses would have to pay households an income. That could be rent, that could be salaries, that could be wages. So that flow to is flow of income. Then when we looked at this as only a two sector model, that went straight into household spending that income on goods and services and businesses producing it. Now things get a little bit more complicated because as we know, households don't only spend their money on goods and services. There are other things that households can do with money. And there's also other avenues where money comes into the economy from externally. So we'll start looking at those in this large bottom section here. So we're gonna have a whole bunch of different things, but the first and main and largest part we'll talk about is what we call private consumption spending. This is the largest part of what we'll end up calling aggregate demand which is basically just all household spending on goods and services. So private consumption spending, and we abbreviate that to C. It's about 70% of all of aggregate demand. Then what other things do we do with our money? Well, one of the things that we do is save it. So private savings is part of this. What else comes out of our income? Well, tax comes out. Obviously we can't spend that money because it's going to the government. And lastly, we might buy things from overseas, which we call imports. These three things all decrease the overall demand for goods and services in the country because we can't be spending it. So we call these things leakages as they are money coming out of aggregate demand. So on the other side with savings, this comes into what we call the financial sector. And on the other side, for the financial sector, sometimes businesses and households will borrow money to invest in the economy. And we call that private investment spending. And that injects more money into the economy because it's coming from the financial sector and going into the economy to increase demand. On the same time, what does the government use our tax for? Well, they use that to inject into the economy on infrastructure and things to benefit society, as well as paying government employees, government day-to-day -day expenses. So we call that government spending and that's money coming in from the government. And then lastly, sometimes from overseas, other countries buy our goods and services which is excellent, that's money coming to our economy that wouldn't be there. Otherwise, we call that exports and they are all injections coming in. So they're very important. So we've got the government sector here 
and the overseas sector here. So all of these things added together are going to be really important. So all these things added together. So when we have C plus I plus G plus X minus M, that's going to be equal to aggregate demand. Aggregate demand is the total level of spending in the whole economy or the total level of expenditure. Basically, it's how much people are spending on goods and services as well as how much is being injected into the economy. And that gives businesses an overall indication of how much demand there is for goods and services that will lead to the final flow. So AD was flow three. And then we get the final flow, which is flow four, which is total production. Which can be known as aggregate supply or total GDP. We'll just write briefly here. And so all these things it just keeps flowing through because then to produce what the businesses need to do, well, they need resources from households. So to do this production, it then flows through, households provide resources to businesses, businesses then provide an income for that, households then spend some of that money, some of that money goes to savings, some goes to tax, some goes to imports. And at the same time, businesses start investing, so that money comes in. The government spends some money on stuff, that comes in. Other countries buy our goods and services, so that money comes in. All of that stuff adds up together to create the total level of demand or aggregate demand, sends signals to businesses, businesses then produce all those goods and services and it flows on and on endlessly. So if anything impacts any of these bottom factors in aggregate demand, it's gonna then have a flow on effect to overall production, employment and the whole economy. One thing that you may have noticed is when we calculate aggregate demand, we don't include savings or tax. Why we don't include those is because they're not actually leaving the economy. They're just not being a contribution to the economy right now. So now we're going to look at a nicer diagram for this. Feel free, if you've got the PowerPoint steal list to put it in your notes, it's a much nicer one, but just following those same flows through and through. Now, if you want to make fun of me, here's a version that I drew on an iPad a long time ago that's horrendous by comparison. So I'm very happy that my one two slides ago looked much nicer. So from this model, we've got five different sectors that are really important. We've got the household sector, where some members sell their resources, so natural labor or capital to businesses and use the money they receive to demand or buy finished goods and services. We've got the business sector, which purchases or demands resources from households, which are then converted into finished goods and services. And we've got the financial sector, which are banks, building societies, the stock exchange, credit unions, and financial companies. These borrow household savings and lend to credit worthy customers to finance investment spending and business expansion. With that private investment spending, for a large part, we talk about it as being mainly businesses, but it's also large investment spending from households. We've got the government sector who collect taxation revenue and other sources and use it to pay for government spending and other outlays that help to provide collective goods and services for society to use and the overseas sector, which is the balance of imports, which we have money being sent to other countries versus exports, which is money coming into us when overseas countries buy our goods and services. So that leads into our four main flows. So that first flow is what we we're talking about before, the resources that households provide to businesses so they can produce goods and services. When we provide those resources, businesses then have to pay us an income for them. So flow two is the total income or the demand for resources. This is where the business sector purchases or demands resources by paying different types of incomes to households. So things like income, wages, rent, or interest repayments if you've loaned a business money. Flow three then becomes total expenditure or aggregate demand. That's our AD uh, equation. So AD equals C plus I plus G plus X minus M. So aggregate demand is influenced by the total value of leakages relative to the total value of injections. So how much money is leaving the economy versus how much money is coming in. All right, so to continue on with flow three, aggregate demand, like I said before, is the total value of all expenditure on goods and services in an economy over a period of time. So aggregate demand is made up by the total of private consumption spending, which is all household spending on goods and services, private investment spending, which is business and consumer investment. So businesses on plants and equipment, households when they borrow money to buy large scale assets, government spending, which includes government infrastructure spending and government outlays, exports, which is foreign nations purchasing our goods and services, and imports, which is Australians purchasing goods and services from other countries. Like I said before, but it's worth repeating, savings in tax are not included in this calculation because although they are not contributing to aggregate demand, currently they will in the future. 
So lastly with accurate demand, we need to talk about factors which are going to impact accurate demand. So accurate demand factors are very similar to normal demand factors, where it's anything that's going to increase the overall amount people will demand without prices really changing at all. So changes in disposable income, changes in interest rates, changes in consumer confidence. Consumer confidence is all about how optimistic consumers feel about future income and um, basically their ability to spend. Business confidence, which is all about how optimistic businesses feel about future um, sales, profits, etc. The exchange rate, which is just the value of our dollar and rates of economic growth overseas. So all these can impact the overall amount of demand and impact those parts of aggregate demand in different ways. So for example, if we were to look at disposable income, if disposable income rises, that's gonna increase private consumption spending and therefore increase aggregate demand. If we look at consumer confidence, that's fairly gonna be the same. Look at business confidence. If businesses are feeling confident, that's gonna increase private investment spending and therefore increase aggregate demand. With the exchange rate, if the exchange rate appreciates, so if the Australian dollar is worth more, we are going to import more and export less because our exports get more expensive and that is then gonna decrease aggregate demand overall. The rates of economic growth overseas has been a massive one for Australia recently. If you look at um, growth rates in China, it can really then lead to exports in Australia changing a lot. So when China's doing well, our exports tend to increase and therefore that increases aggregate demand overall. So these are aggregate demand factors. Some tips in terms of structuring your answers in SACS. Many of your questions will be structured similar to this. So it'll be explain how, and then I'll insert an aggregate demand factor, impacts on either aggregate demand or domestic macroeconomic goal. So the most important things to do when answering a question like this is to describe that factor that is changing, outline how it impacts a component of aggregate demand and if it increases or decreases it and why, and then state how it impacts aggregate demand overall. Then we get to flow four and we're close to the end, which is flow four being the final goods and services supplied or GDP. So the total value of finished goods and services produced or supplied by the business sector over a period of time. This flow reflects the overall level of Australian economic activity and is commonly measured by GDP or more accurately real GDP per annum basically tells us without inflation, how much we've increased production over a year. So aggregate supply being the total supply of goods and services a nation can potentially produce. It's especially affected by the availability of a nation's resources and the efficiency in which they're used. So this then limits the overall potential for growth in the short term, because we can only increase a certain amount sustainably. So factors which impact our aggregate supply are exactly the same as what impacted regular supply back in area study one. So in its simplest form, it ends up being anything that impacts our cost of production or efficiency. If cost of production goes down, aggregate supply will rise. If efficiency goes up, aggregate supply will rise. It's very important. Any of these factors go straight towards that. So the quantity and quality of factors of production, if we have high quality resources, it's gonna make us more efficient, increase aggregate supply. If our cost of production changes, so if electricity gets more expensive, businesses will have a higher cost of production, they'll be less profitable, they won't want to produce as much, and therefore they'll decrease their overall supply. Technological change should make us more efficient. Productivity growth, if it's increasing, we're more efficient, we want to produce more, it's more profitable. Exchange rates is a tricky one. Exchange rates is all about basically for cost of production for businesses. If we have a higher exchange rate, it's cheaper for businesses to import inputs from overseas and therefore they've got a lower cost of production and we should have a higher aggregate supply. Climatic events has been a massive one in Australia recently with all our floods, bushfires, etc. that damages our natural resources and limits our aggregate supply and productive capacity. And then other events including government regulations, so laws, legislations, etc., like lockdowns and disruptions to international supply chains, which have been huge over the last two years. So that's it for this massive chunk of content. All of this is so important to the whole of VC economics. So hopefully, it got across to you and it made a lot of sense. If not, leave a question below and I'll help you out as best I can or email me, sean at the running economy.com. I hope you're having a wonderful time getting halfway through unit three and I'll see you next time to start the goal of strong and sustainable economic growth. Goodbye.